Chris Hedges, welcome to The Public. Thank you. In your most recent book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, that you co-wrote with Joe Sacco, you visit what you call four sacrifice zones, that uh, places within the United States that amplify what happens, what the, the human cost of our ever-growing need for corporate profit. Were there any particular stories or, or anecdotes that, that stuck out to you in, in these travels? Um, I mean, I think every, every place was so devastating that I'd have a hard time picking one. Um, are the most egregious uh, examples of abuse were found in Immokalee in the produce fields where uh, we ran into workers who had been literally held in conditions of slavery. Uh, we interviewed a worker who had been chained every night in the back of a truck with other workers forced to defecate in a corner of the truck for over two years. I mean, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think the other very striking uh, impression that Joe and I walked away with was how uh, how often within the United States you could replicate conditions that we were used to seeing in the third world uh, and how these uh, conditions of poverty and abuse uh, have become invisible courtesy of a corporate media that just doesn't tell these people stories or show the conditions on which they live. I mean, for instance, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, the average life expectancy for a male is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of Haiti. At any one time, uh, 60% of the residents on Pine Ridge have neither electricity or running water. Many living in sod huts, an estimated 80% alcoholism rate, um, I mean, these are uh, conditions that one does not uh, normally associate with with the United States, and yet there is a, an expanding underclass uh, that is living in this kind of, of poverty. Uh, you know, Camden, New Jersey, per capita, the, which is the second chapter of the book, per capita is the poorest city uh, in the United States. It spends 75% of its city budget on fire and police. That means every other service from education on down is only allocated 25% of the budget. And a week or two ago, Camden just fired its entire police force. Uh, Camden also is always ranked uh, as the first or second most dangerous city in the United States. They fired the police force to break the police union, and they will hire uh, contract workers, county police officials, to come in and police the city. Right. Libraries being closed. I mean, it, it, the devas I think the the extent of the devastation in all of these places. Although we'd read about it and uh, you know seeing it was really sobering. Like, like you mentioned, you were a, a foreign correspondent for many years. Um, no, you're no stranger to witnessing despair and suffering. You've been in, in Sudan during famines and, and Gaza and um, Bosnia during the war. Were you yourself prepared? Like you said, you you had read about it. Were you prepared for the level of despair right right within your own country? No, nor at the extent of it. I mean, for instance, we flew over the Appalachian Mountains, uh, and one reads about mountaintop removal from the air when you see hundreds of thousands of acres, uh, you know, one of the most important mountain ranges, the lungs of the eastern seaboard, the headwaters of the eastern seaboard, turned into a toxic wasteland, blowing the top 400 feet off of mountains because coal companies want to, don't want to dig down for the seams, uh, building up these gigantic, uh, you know, billion-gallon sludge uh, ponds filled with heavy metals and toxic waste, uh, the air is fetid. Uh, you go into uh, elementary schools in the nurse's office, and it's just rows of little inhalers for the children. Uh, cancer is an epidemic. We were in uh, towns in uh, southern West Virginia where everyone in the town has had their gallbladder removed because the water is poisoned. I mean, this is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the scale of it. Uh, 
uh, you drive through these old coal camps in southern West Virginia, and Joe and I thought we were back in Bosnia. Uh, and you drive into these places, and it's just one spindly chimney surrounded by charred timbers after another. I mean, uh, and, and that was something, of course, we saw, Joe and I both saw in Bosnia, and there were, we just kept doing double takes. We thought uh, we were back in, in the war in Yugoslavia. What was the actual process? Like, how did you choose these four particular places? And I mean, how long did you go for it? Because some of the stories you got, people really seem to open up to you. I'm thinking about the case of um, Mike, who was Red on... Red Cloud, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, his story, uh, he basically tells you his life story over a couple of hours. How did you approach uh, telling these people uh, their stories? It, we went back more than once to all of these places. We also, uh, like any good foreign correspondent, had read extensively before we went in. So um, I live in Princeton, and I had gone over to the Princeton University Library with canvas bags and pretty much cleared out their shelves on Lakota traditions, history, religion. Uh, uh, so we, we didn't walk in blind. Uh, we We made sure we had very good contacts because... These communities are very insular. In the case of the produce fields, uh, I, I speak Spanish very well. I spent many years in Latin America. Uh, there was a case where uh, we virtually never used English. I had to translate for Joe. Um, but in all of these places, we uh, went in with people who had uh, very deep roots within the community, and this made all the difference um, in terms of access and in terms of trust. In southern West Virginia, we traveled with one of the ministers, Amanda Reed, um, and, and that was, I think, the only way that we would have gotten into these homes. Uh, and Mike Redcloud, who you cite, and who Joe, you know, in this book, there's 50 pages of illustrations, and Joe will often draw out the stories and, and panels uh, of some of the most uh, powerful narratives that we encountered. So you not only hear it, but you see it. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, uh, part of the goal of the book, was to make these people visible. And I think that uh, the illustrations within the book give it a kind of punch and power that simple prose would not have had, that it goes a long way to achieving what we wanted, is, and that is to, to get people to see uh, how increasing uh, numbers of Americans are living, because we don't see them through... The commercial media. I mean, we have in this country now uh, 47 million Americans living in poverty and tens of millions of Americans living in a category called near poverty. Uh, our real unemployment rate, when one counts people who have stopped looking for work or people who have poorly paid part-time jobs. I mean, for instance, in Walmart, the average worker works 28 hours a week and so that their wages are actually uh, below the poverty line, and they qualify for food stamp. One of the first things the Walton family, the owners of Walmart, does uh, to these workers is give them applications for food stamps. Uh, and one should note that the Waltons themselves earn $11,000 an hour. Um, that's the world we're creating, a kind of oligarchic state, uh, a neo-feudal corporate state, uh, and the United States in some ways is more extreme, but uh, Canada is not exempt. Uh, the 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 uh, the world is being recreated uh, into a, a kind of corporate neo feudalism, where you have uh, oligarchic elites who no longer have any loyalty to any particular nation state, uh, and they are telling workers around the globe that they have to be competitive in a global marketplace, which in essence means being competitive with prison labor in China or sweatshop workers in, in Bangladesh who make uh, 22 cents an hour. That's the world that we're creating. Uh, you know, the United States, uh, especially the working class, at least until the financial meltdown of 2008, was able to borrow uh, through credit uh, to maintain a, le a lifestyle in the same way that the nation has been borrowing to maintain an imperium that neither can afford. Uh, and all of it's coming due. Uh, the... Um, the, the last chapter, Days of Revolt, takes place in New York City with the Occupy Wall Street movement in Zuccotti Park uh, because it argues, or the or, you know one of the kind of uh, fundamental themes of the book is that you better look very carefully at what happened to these sacrifice zones 
because they went first and we're going next. In an age when there is no impediment, no regulation of corporate capitalism, everything has become a commodity. Human beings are commodities. The natural world is a commodity that these forces will exploit until exhaustion or collapse. And we see that with the terrifying melting of the summer Arctic ice, 40% of it. And what's the response of the corporate state? It's to, uh, you know, go up and uh, fish out the last vestiges of uh, the, the stocks in the ocean to exploit it for gas, uh, oil, and minerals. It, it's a kind of uh, collective suicide uh, rather than respond to the death knell of the ecosystem itself on which we, of course, as a species, depend for life. And uh, and the book is really a, a kind of window into, uh, of course, it's written off the ground, but it's a window into... What happens when human beings, human communities, uh, and the environment are forced to prostrate themselves before the dictates of the marketplace? What you end up is with is a kind of uh, you know toxic wasteland and people uh, broken uh, and, and living in tremendous despair. Uh, and what happened to them is now, of course, being visited upon the rest of us. That's the process that's underway. They they are going under tremendous despair, and it, and it's and what struck me throughout the book is the theme of the comfort of consciousness, and you've talked a lot about this as well. I mean, in all four locations, the drug use and alcohol use is, is rampant, and uh, the meager earnings um, go to to line the pockets of, of of the corporations who who are at many times causing the suffering in the first place. Um, and, and there's also extreme violence. People turn on each other instead of l- realizing what the source of of their suffering is. Can you can you talk about the I guess the comfort of unconsciousness, like I'm, and how we can try to live with with the suffering and, and find a way out of it? Well, I mean, first I should say that in all of these sacrifice zones, there were heroic figures who rose up to resist. Uh, who understood perhaps even the hopelessness of resistance and yet resisted anyway. Uh, those people that held themselves together usually did so through uh, through religiosity, uh, not necessarily Christian, of course, on Pine Ridge. That was done through a return to Lakota traditions, to sweat lodges, to the Sundance. I went to a Sundance four days of uh, fasting and dancing around a festooned uh, cottonwood tree, small flesh offerings, very, very moving. Uh, you know, many of the men out there are covered with prison tattoos, really struggling to put their life uh, back together. Um, and everyone's hanging on by their fingertips. And, of course, as you point out, um, large numbers, large percentages of people in these uh, zones descend into uh, substance abuse, addictions. I mean, everywhere we went, that was a problem. In in, uh, Pine Ridge, it was alcohol. In uh, uh, Camden, it was uh, harder drugs, uh, crack, uh, something called wet, which is marijuana leaves smoked, uh, soaked in uh, PCP. In uh, southern West Virginia, it was opiates, uh, like Oxycontin. They call it hillbilly heroin. And you'd walk into these... um, old coal camps and start doing interviews, and it, you felt like you were interviewing zombies. I mean, everybody's speech was slurred. Their eyes were sort of glassy. They moved slowly. I mean, they took staggering amounts of opiates. I mean, one of the young men that we profile in the book died of an overdose seven weeks after we spoke with him. And then, of course, uh, back in the produce fields, alcohol, again, is a problem. Um, and as you're right, that, that the uh, sort of lack of consciousness uh, the inability to understand the configurations of oppression and how it works. And I think that the mass media plays a huge part in this, um, has led these communities to turn on themselves so that uh, you have terrible uh, gang violence within Camden. Uh, you also have uh, gang problems on Pine Ridge, where you have competing Native American gangs uh, who fight each other. Um, and uh, and I think that comes from 
a very effective system of propaganda disseminated primarily through television, um, uh, but and Hollywood, and it works. And and the message, uh, I think, has resonated even among the poorest within the United States. And the message says, uh, reality is never an impediment to what you desire. That if you dig deep enough within yourselves and you work hard and you remain positive and you focus on happiness and you can have everything you want. Of course, that's magical thinking in a place where there are no jobs. Um, but it is just pounded home as a kind of mantra, whether it's on Oprah, whether it's uh, through uh, Hollywood blockbusters, whether it's on television, uh, whether it's through the Christian right. Uh, uh, and, and it's become very effective. And I think that that lack of consciousness is something that I find deeply disturbing. I mean, if you go back a century, you would have had uh, radical unions in there, uh, you know, explaining systems of exploitation. And the fury would have been directed outwards instead of inwards. But that's part of the kind of dark beauty of corporate America. And I mean, even at the at the liberal or educated class, it's the same constant struggle is is living in reality or, or ceding to the, the comfort of unconsciousness. I mean, well, the liberal class, and I wrote a whole book on this called Death of the Liberal Class, that, that, that the problem with the liberal class, and in, in particular academia, is that it busied itself with boutique activism, multiculturalism, uh, inclusiveness, gender politics, none of which I'm against, of course. But it forgot the primacy of justice, so it turned its back, in essence, on the working class. And, uh, and and that's why you find, in places in southern West Virginia, the most retrograde elements of the cable news channels resonate. O'Reilly and Michelle Bachman and all these figures, most of whom are probably certifiably insane. Whereas at the turn of the century, it was radicals like Mother Jones or... Uh, John Lewis, the head of the United Mine Workers Union, or Eugene V. Debs. I mean, they, they resonated. Uh, and, and I think that, that much of the fault lies with the liberal establishment that, um, that really turned their back uh, during this tremendous assault against working men and women and um, focused on uh, issues that, in terms of economic justice, are tan tangential. Uh, and that's why academia and most of the liberal establishment have so little to say to us uh, at, at this particular moment in time, because um, they've effectively severed themselves from the working class and the poor. And uh, and I think, you know, at a time of crisis, and we're certainly in a time of crisis, um, for that reason, have become largely irrelevant. Can, can I ask how, how you yourself cope with the darkness i mean you like i mentioned earlier you spent many years uh in war zones and and seeing extreme suffering and then now you work in this and you're out there all the time talking about sort of the grave dangers we're facing as a society from global warming to economic collapse and uh, i guess how, how do you yourself cope with that i mean it certainly can't be easy having to deal with these issues on a consciously on a day-to-day -day basis well, no, and it certainly you know brings with it a kind of despair. Um, if I had to put my money down, I would say that the radical reconfiguration that is essential for our survival as a species is probably a long shot. Um, I really think you keep going by not uh, making uh, you know the oppressed an abstraction. Um, that when you and of course Joe and I have spent the last two years in these communities. When you build those kinds of relationships, um, and for th this is really the reason why I also teach inmates at a correctional facility in New Jersey, all of whom are African American, um, because you know when you build relationships with those who uh, bear the brunt end of this kind of repression, uh, not to go out and fight on their behalf is a kind of betrayal. Um, right. And, Once you've witnessed it, you can't ignore well, it anymore. And you, it hurts because you care about them. I mean, and you see how the deck has been stacked against them and how unfair and, and unjust 
power is within their lives. I mean, it's why I've been so vocal on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, because I've spent months of my life in Gaza, uh, where you know I have, I have friends who suffer in ways that are unimaginable to me. Uh, and not to speak out is a kind of betrayal that uh, that you can engage in when you care. Uh, it's why I've just been so fierce against the Obama administration, uh, because for me, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the proxy wars in Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen, countries I've spent time in, is just unforgivable. I, I can't, I have friends there. I can't, uh, you know, uh, you know, I can't justify going back if, unless I've done everything within my power, however futile, to stand up against uh, preemptive war, which is illegal war. It's defined under post-Nuremberg laws as a criminal war of aggression. And, uh, I mean, for that reason, I won't vote for Obama. I voted for Nader, uh, well, since he's been running. And, um, and I will vote for a third-party candidate this time. That's a small act. Voting doesn't mean much anymore in the dead political system of the United States. Um, but I just, you know, you, 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 when you have those kinds of relationships, then that kind of violence and that kind of suffering is not an abstraction, it's personal. And I think that that is the engine that keeps things going. I mean, Augustine said that hope has two beautiful daughters, uh, anger and courage, anger at the way things are and courage to see that they don't remain the way they are. Uh, and, and then my kids. I have four kids, and uh, um, you know, I'm uh, my wife and I, who's Canadian, um, are very, very private people. And I think that you know, you you look at how we have betrayed, you know, the next generation, and you, as a parent, uh, have to go out and fight on their behalf. Um, you know, because even if I fail or we fail, uh, I would I would want my children to say, well, at least he tried. You talk in the book about how the vulnerable and the weak die and suffer without anybody taking note, um, and which is why I think this this book is so important. Is because it goes to the places and these stories that otherwise I've never heard of. Um, right now in Toronto, as we're recording this, um, the Toronto International Film Festival is going on, and, and the amount of media, even from our national broadcaster CBC, being devoted to to the glitz and the glamour is just mind staggering. Is it uh, is it hard to to go out there and and find people willing to to listen to the stories when there's so many easy distractions? Well, I mean, most people don't want to hear it, and yet this book has been number six on the New York Times list of bestsellers. Um, and you know, in terms of real numbers, uh, you're talking with 320 million people in the United States. You only need to sell about 45,000 books to get on the bestseller list. So you know, I was an English major, but that's a percentage of the one percent. Um, I'm sure Jersey Shore gets a few, few more thousand than that. Of course, of course, and you know, you know how many people get Lady Gaga's tweets? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you you have to put in perspective. You have to carry out the fight you can carry out, and yet, as a dissident, I have a very privileged position in in that I can make a living, um, and that allows me to continue to do what I do. And, and there aren't many of us out there that can do that. Um, so I feel that, you know, I have a privileged perch in the sense that I have a voice and I'm able to sustain myself uh, by uh, expressing this reality. Um, but you're right, I don't have any illusion. I, I remember I spoke once in Houston and uh, the Rothko Chapel, which seats 400 people. And when I arrived, they had uh, 400 people outside who couldn't get in. And so I said, okay, we'll come back in an hour, and I'll give the talk again. Uh, but somebody reminded me that a block away was a mega church that did three services on Sunday, each of which were filled with 10,000 people. Uh, and that was sort of a good reference point. That's sort of what we're up against. Uh and yet, um, you know, I think you can't use the word hope if you don't resist. And, um, uh, you know, at that point, you know, hope or real hope dies. I mean, hope is not uh, this kind of happy talk. Uh, you know, the, the, 
is the eternal optimism, um, which has become a kind of sickness within Western society, but in fact, a realistic assessment of where we are and what's happening, and climate change is pretty big on that, and then an attempt to respond to it. I mean, part of the problem with climate change is that um, both responses are forms of magical thinking, one response being that it doesn't exist, and the other that we can adapt. Uh, and there are just precious few people. Bill McKibben is out there and a few others, um, you know, who are ringing the alarm bells, but it's just sort of frightening how few people want to see it. From the roots up. CIUT 89.5 FM, Toronto. You're listening to The Public on CIUT 89.5. I'm your host, Cameron Kainers. You can subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or check out thepublicradio.org to listen to past episodes. Back to my conversation with journalist, author, and outspoken public intellectual, Chris Hedges. You, you just wrote a, a column for your weekly column for Truth Egg talking about your vacation to Maine and, and seeing all the changes. Uh, c- could you talk about what you saw there? Well, I grew up in the country and um, spent a lot of time outdoors. And as anybody who spends a lot of time outdoors will tell you, um, there are seismic changes now within the natural world that are really terrifying. Um, temperature being one, I mean, the the ocean temperature off the coast of Maine has risen by five degrees. Um, the fish stocks are dead. Um, you know, most of the coast of Maine, well, 80% of the uh, fishing industry in Maine are lobsters. Uh, the only thing that are crawling around on the bottom uh, anymore are crustaceans, crabs, and lobsters. Um, and you're watching uh, with rising temperatures, uh, whole sections of forest die off. I remember I was hiking a couple summers up uh, ago up near Mount Katahdin, and ran into poplar groves that were just inexplicably dead. Uh, And we we don't know what it was. Was it some kind of a a blight? Was it? uh, But there are, uh, you know, very, very frightening changes that are underway. Extreme weather, of course, being the most visible. But when you get out uh, into the forests, uh, you know, into the coastlines where we just were for the month of August, you, you begin to see that we're killing, we're killing the world, we're killing the natural world. And, uh, and the response of the corporate state is not one of stewardship, but one of exploiting it in its death throes. I mean, this is the whole battle of the Arctic, which I mentioned before. Um, and it, it is insane. It's, I mean, it makes Moby Dick the most prescient novel written on Western society. We've all become Ahab, where, um, Ahab said, my, my means and my, uh, my method are saying only my goal is mad. Uh, and, of course, he brings the whole ship down with him. That's where we're headed. That is what unfettered, unregulated capitalism is about. Marx got it. It has built within it a quality of self-annihilation. And now that there are no impediments left, uh, that self-annihilation is uh, becoming uh, more and more visible as as things deteriorate, both economically and environmentally. Now, you've talked a lot about how we've lost the sense of the sacred. You, you quote uh, or talk about Sitting Bull saying that nothing in the eyes of the white settlers has an intrinsic value, and um, and you, as well as Max Weber saying Western society has basically had a disenchantment of the world. Um, what's your own importance in, in seeing, remembering that the sacred and and the intrinsic in stopping the the descent towards corporatism. Well, because for the for corporations, there is no sacred. Um, nothing has an intrinsic value. Everything has a monetary value that you exploit uh, until it is exhausted or until it collapses, which is precisely what's happening, both in terms of human capital and in terms of the environment. And Carl Polanyi, the great economist. Um, who lived in, taught at Columbia, but lived in Canada because his wife uh, was never allowed in the United States at the, with the hysteria, hysteria of anti-communism, writes in a, his, his book, 1944 book, The Great Transformation, that 
although he's an economist, the societies who lose the capacity for the sacred destroy themselves. Um, and, and that is exactly it. When, uh, you know, when life itself, when the systems of life itself are valued solely in their ability to generate monetary profit, um, then they are inevitably extinguished. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that is very much a part of the society at large where, um, you know, that these pre-modern societies understood the interconnectedness of life. They were also communal societies in the sense that people who hoarded things for themselves were despised. Uh, it was a completely different ethic. And I, you know, spent some time in the first chapter on Pine Ridge arguing that it wasn't just about the expropriation of land for the railroad barons and the miners and the gold speculators and the timber merchants and uh, the people who wanted to decimate the buffalo herds, uh, but it was also about destroying that competing ethic. Uh, capitalism, uh, you know, because at its core it's so rapacious, really defines itself more by what it is against rather than what it promotes. And um, I don't think it's accidental that when Marx and Engels begin their work on communism, they uh, spend a lot of time looking at the governance system of the Iroquois nation. Indeed, if you get Marx's notebooks, and they're impossible to get, I had to get them out of the rare book room library at uh, Princeton, um, and read them, there's just page after page of detailed observations on how the Iroquois as well as other pre-modern societies, govern themselves. Um, and we have to go back to that ethic. We have to create an ethic uh, not based on the, you know, the idea that capitalist expansion is limitless, uh, but, uh, but, but around the idea of, of conservation um, and a new kind of simplicity, and I think speaking as an American, a new kind of humility in terms of how we deal with the rest of the world, if we're going to survive. Is that an ethic you, you grew up with? I mean, you grew, you're from a, a religious family and you studied uh, in seminary school. Did you always have that sense of the importance of, of the sacred and the importance of interconnectedness? Yeah, and I, I think it didn't necessarily come from the way I was brought up, although I was brought up that way, but more from the fact that I spent so much of my childhood and adolescence outdoors um and um this is in vermont in new hampshire mostly hiking in the white mountains every summer when i was in college i led trips in the white mountains and, and i made sure that or i've made sure that my own children spend a lot of time in the outdoors for that reason um because it there's all sorts of well one it it unplugs you from your iphone and your computer screen your television um, it, 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 it's humbling. I mean, it, you know, especially if you're really out there, it, you know, caught on peaks and lightning storms and, uh, coping with the elements with not every, everything you have is on your back. Um, it, it's, it puts you in your place, uh, within the universe. Uh, and it, it makes you understand finally that nature is not something to be trifled with. I mean, hubris is a very dangerous uh, emotion and uh, or psychological condition when the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, inveigh against constantly. But it is finally human hubris, uh, which is about to be taught a lesson uh, it, it, by, because of its assault against the natural world. I mean, we've all become Icarus, and 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 the uh, and the wax is melting really quickly. You also went to quite prestigious universities. You went to Colgate and Harvard. I mean, you're surrounded by people, presumably, who go on to, to work in the establishment. Were you, did you always have a different political leaning compared to your your classmates? Or did you slowly evolve to, to come to the views you're at now? No, I, I always did. I When I graduated from college, I moved into a housing project in the inner city in Boston and Roxbury and lived there for two and a half years and ran a small church while I was a seminarian. So I was always geared in that direction, and I I actually dropped out of divinity school to go to Latin America, uh, in particular Argentina, during the Dirty War, 
to write. I came back and finished my degree and then turned around and went to El Salvador to be a freelance reporter. Uh, very influenced by Orwell. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I think it it wasn't, it is true that I went to these places and worked for the New York Times, but um, I, I don't think that there was any kind of a cataclysmic transformation or catharsis. Um, uh, you know, I think it was always there. And when I did work for the New York Times, I consciously, as a reporter, always placed myself with the victims of tremendous oppression, whether that was in El Salvador or whether that was in Gaza or whether that was in Sarajevo, where I was during the war, or Kosovo, or anywhere else. Um, and these were often physically very uncomfortable places to be, as well as dangerous. So I remember when I asked the editor of the New York Times, I was a Middle East bureau chief at the time, if I could uh, cover the war in Bosnia, he said, well, I guess the line starts and ends with you. Uh, of course, by that time, 45 foreign reporters have been killed in Sarajevo. Um, so there wasn't a lot of competition. Um, papers had to have them covered. Uh, I didn't want to follow around the president or the secretary of state or do lunch with, you know, officials in Washington. I, I purposely put myself in these positions uh, because, for me, it was a way within an established news organization to maintain my integrity. How, how did you become a war correspondent in the first place um, after going to seminary school? Well... When I was in seminary in the early 1980s, uh, you had uh, murderous dictatorships in place throughout Latin America, not only the junta in Argentina, which disappeared 30,000 of its own citizens, but Pinochet in Chile, uh, the death squads in El Salvador were killing between 700 and 1,000 people a month, Rios Mont in Guatemala, and... Uh, and again, you know, as I mentioned, being very influenced by Orwell, uh, you know, a writer I still hold up as sort of, you know, my intellectual and moral mentor, uh, I thought it was as close as my generation was going to come to fighting fascism. So I went to Latin America for that reason, uh, to be a writer in the midst of this kind of extremity. So I, when I got my degree from Harvard Divinity School, uh, I'd saved up enough money for a one-way ticket uh, to El Salvador and uh, began covering the war as a freelance reporter, and I was there eventually for five years. And have you had you ever done anything like that? Had you ever been in, in the midst of that sort of... Well, I'd never been in war, of course, um, and so I was young. I was like 24 years old or something, so I uh, traveled. I was sort of tutored, in a way, by older correspondents, most of whom at that point had covered the war in Vietnam, very few of whom spoke Spanish. And my I did speak Spanish, so I would often work as a translator. I'd make money, actually, as a translator in many cases. And um, they, they really, you know, they don't have a lot of time to take people along. Uh, but I had a skill that was useful to them. Uh, and so I really learned. I didn't study journalism, never took a journalism course, but I learned how to do it through... Um, this older generation who, after the Vietnam War, had been sent to cover the war uh, in El Salvador. So did you just see that as the way to make more change was by going to the places that aren't being documented? Well, I was a writer. I mean, although I'd gone to divinity school, I began writing poems, short stories as a very young age and published my first piece in a historical journal when I was 14. And published a piece in the Christian Science Monitor when I was in college, and then did the usual stuff, like being editor of my school paper and all that. So I, I wrote uh, constantly, obsessively. Um, I was very close to my dad, who was a Presbyterian minister and a social activist, very involved in the civil rights movement, the uh, anti-war movement, although he'd been a veteran from World War II. He'd been a sergeant in North Africa. And then the gay rights movement, his brother, my uncle was gay, and my father was very outspoken in the 70s on, uh, when it was not very common for an ordained minister to be outspoken uh, on the rights of, of uh, uh, GBTL citizens, you know, both within and outside the church. So, uh, you know, I went to divinity school because that's the tradition that I came out of, and yet I was a writer, clearly. Um, 
and I think that as uh, my time in Divinity School, uh, you know, over time, I realized that that's really where I should be and what I wanted to do. So um, I think I was actually, by going to Latin America and beginning to write, I was um, becoming more in touch with sort of who I was and and what I should do. Um, uh, and so it wasn't it wasn't an actual shift. It was more a kind of uh, recognition that 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 that's what I should spend my life doing. So you always, in some sense, knew that writing was what you wanted to do. Yes, if you'd asked me when I was six years old what I wanted to be, I would have told you a writer. Were there any authors besides Orwell early on that you read that really got you excited about the ability of, of the uh, written word? Yeah, I mean, I read voraciously um, Faulkner. For, I mean, it's embarrassing, but as a teenager, I wanted to be William Faulkner, so I would write these horrible short stories trying to sound like Faulkner. But I think most artists imitate at the beginning. Um, uh yeah, I mean, I there, there's so much great writing. Um, uh, Fitzgerald and uh, Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath, and um, yeah, I mean, I I uh, eventually went on to. I'm a huge fan of Proust. I live on a kind of steady diet of Shakespeare. I mean, I continue to read a lot of a lot of novels. During your years as a, a foreign correspondent, did you have? Uh have any sort of home base or were you able to maintain a sense of groundedness at all? No. Uh, I mean, you lived, I lived overseas for 20 years. So I would live in San Salvador, or Cairo or Jerusalem or Zagreb, but I was constantly traveling. So it was a kind of funny way to travel because, you know, in, in combat zones, you're really often traveling with just what you have on your back. And yet at the same time, you've got $15,000 in your pocket and a satellite phone. So it's, um, you don't live with much, and yet you have a kind of power, and you have economic resources that those around you do not have. And I, I mean, you you've been faced with so many dangerous situations. Um, was it there ever time where you wanted to go back and just lead a normal life? Yeah, I think you eventually everybody has limits, and I think by the war in Kosovo, I realized that I lacked the physical and emotional resiliency that I'd had. 20 years earlier, and it was time to stop. Plus, you know, you struggle with PTSD and other issues. So I got out. I mean, a lot of my friends couldn't get out, and, and some of my friends who couldn't get out are no longer with us. Uh, From wounds in the war? For, well, they killed. I mean, uh, Marie Colvin was just killed in Syria. Uh, my closest friend, uh, Kurt Shork, was killed with another friend in an ambush in Sierra Leone. I lost uh, two colleagues well, a good friend, Elizabeth Newfer in the Iraq. Well, yeah, I mean, they it, it's a very uh, heady lifestyle. Uh, it's very hard to adjust when you come back. It's an adrenaline-driven vocation, and people go back for one more hit, and then they don't come back. I had actually gone back. I'd taken a fellowship in 98-99 uh, at Harvard for a study classics for a year, and then turned around and went back. got caught in a very bad ambush in Gaza where there was a kid about 10 feet away from me, shot and killed. Uh, and I just realized, you know, I had to I had to stop. Because um, your, your luck runs out. And, and I did. And, I mean, at the end of the book, you mentioned um, how the being in Sudan during the famine and how the, the faces of the, the children dying of famine still haunt you. How did you, well, have you been able to, I guess, have a normal life in, in some sense? And... Well, I don't think anybody who goes through those experiences has a normal life. I don't know what a normal life is. Um, right. But you're certainly conscious. I mean, Goldman Sachs runs the largest, largest commodities index in the world. Um, these people make a lot of money buying up the futures of basic staples, corn, uh, you know, wheat, uh, livestock, and then hoarding it and then selling it when the price go up. Well, you know, I mentioned the famine in the Sudan in the book because I was there watching hundreds, thousands of people starve to death. I know what it means when wheat uh, rises in prices and la has over the last year by 100%. And, uh, uh, and, and not a lot of people do. Uh, and probably even the traders in Goldman Sachs don't know. Uh, but I've been there. 
and that is why I led uh, people's hearings of Goldman Sachs in Zuccotti Park with Cornell West, and then um, we marched on Goldman Sachs where I was arrested for um, blocking the entrance along with other Occupy demonstrators. And um, and I did that because, um, you know, there are so many small, broken lives that never made it uh, because of greed uh, and, and because I could be there and they couldn't. Uh, like you say, I mean, what the effects of these huge profits are completely unseen to the people who are, are making them. And I also saw a debate uh, you had on religion with um, Sam Harris, where basically he is is writing out a, a, a case for torture, if, like the ticking time bomb. Right. And and you mentioned how for you, torture isn't an abstraction. Right. Well, I, I've been a special guest of the Iraqi secret police myself, so. Okay, can you talk about, about that? What happened? I was captured uh, in Basra during the Shiite uprising uh, at the end of the first Gulf War, taken prisoner. And, I, I mean, you, you mentioned just, you, you sort of skip over, but you mentioned that you, you thought you were going to die or they expected you to die, the people who captured you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I talk about that in War is a Force that gives us meaning, but they thought we were going to be killed. We weren't, but obviously, but uh, we were we were in a lot of combat. I was taken cap prisoner by an Iraqi Republican Guard unit, and then eventually we were turned over to the Muhabarat for 24 hours, and our captors, and I speak Arabic, so I developed a relationship with the unit that I was with, and they were openly worried that we would be executed. So, but I was I was with some other journalists, and although I knew that and heard it, I was the only Arabic speaker, and I never told the other journalists that because I figured there wasn't much we could do about it. So we might as well let them be able to live with some kind of tranquility. Right. I mean, what what strikes me is that um, these sort of uh, corporations that we, we've unleashed, there's no one person. It's, it's a faceless structure, and no one person feels responsible for these devastating effects that, that they have on, on real people's lives. Um and it's all it's all un, unseen. So. Well, that's how bureaucracies work. I mean, that is how the Nazi killing machine worked. Everybody had a small little piece, you know. Somebody had to make the trains run. Uh, you know, somebody had to fill out the deep, deportation forms. Somebody had to seize the bank accounts. Somebody had to hand out, you know, the the yellow armbands with the star of, you know, it, it, just a little pieces of it here and there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gita Sereni does a pretty good job in her book on Stengel, the uh, commandant of Sobibor, Into That Darkness, sort of explaining exactly this point, as does, of course, Hannah Arendt does in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's so easy to to do something that, that is um, immoral without even realizing it, because of resp- the responsibility that we have in the situation is almost invisible. Well, that, and that, there you go. That's Goldman Sachs. I mean, you know, what the people in the commodities price index in Goldman Sachs do, there's a word for it. It's called murder. Uh, but if you say that to them, they, they would just look at you like you're insane. I guess, I guess to, to end off, I want to ask you about, uh, you, you talk about the the power of the powerlessness and uh, because it has the, it gives you the ability to, to live in truth. Could you just expand on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Havel got it, that, that, the, that the internal mechanisms of power are now so corrupt uh, that at this point, standing up and speaking a fundamental truth about them is a deeply subversive act and deeply threatening. And I think that the corporations were terrified by the Occupy movement, which is why they orchestrated through the security and surveillance state uh, their physical eradication um, because they know that within their organisms uh, of oppression are many, many people who understand how corrupt it is. And, uh, and that makes them as superstructures very weak, especially uh, in terms of the police. Uh, there just there comes a time when uh, the foot soldiers who are tasked with carrying out control no longer uh, carry it out. I mean, I saw that in East Germany with the uh, 
uh, collapse of the communist government, uh, Eric Honecker sent down an elite paratroop division to Leipzig, and the paratroop division wouldn't open fire on the crowd. And at that point, it was over. Honecker lasted another week in power. The Russian Revolution was largely a nonviolent revolution. It's when the Cossacks were ordered to quell the bread riots in Petrograd, uh, and they arrived in the city and uh, and didn't fire on the crowd and started fraternizing with the rioters that, that led to the Tsar abdicating in a railway car as he was coming back from the front. Uh, that's how it works. And I think that the corporate systems of power are that corrupt and that fragile, uh, that speaking this truth and standing up to them uh, is one that, uh, you know, has the capacity to discredit them. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not going to win by playing their game. I've been very critical of the black bloc anarchists, and I'm debating them in New York on the 12th um, over this issue. That it, you know, we're not going to run headlong into the pillars that hold the establishment together. We're going to draw elements of those pillars towards us. Uh, and, and that, I think, is our, our only hope for uh, dismantling uh, or reversing the corporate coup d'etat um, that's taken place. And getting, I guess, losing our sense of, of hubris. I mean, you talk about the uh, the bankers and uh, at Sicardi Park taking pictures and, and sort of laughing at, at the... This was Goldman Sachs. When we came down, they they came all came down to the lobby with their iPhones and cameras and took pictures of us like we were you know, some kind of carnival diversion, animals in a cage, which in fact we soon were a few hours later, uh, you know, some kind of funny lunchtime diversion, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we feel like we're, when we're doing well, we're clever and we're strong and, you know, we're responsible for our own success. I mean, uh, I just was curious, has having to deal with your own mortality so many times in these close calls and covering so many places full of violence and despair. Has that helped you be able to live within truth despite everything that's hurled at you and all the, the uncomforts that come along with it? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's after you come out of those kinds of experiences, you're less susceptible to being made afraid. And they, the state has worked overtime to try and make us afraid and in our fear surrender all sorts of civil liberties and rights that we should have never surrendered. Um, uh, yeah, it, I think it, you know, it gives you a kind of vision of the brevity and fragility of life and, and, and the importance of standing up now, because, um, you know, if you wait, uh, you may never stand up. And you ask Larry Gibson in West Virginia, um, whose little piece of property on, on this mountain has been completely surrounded and destroyed by the, the open pit mining. You ask him what, what keeps him going? What keeps you going? I, you know, uh, because I think, you know, as Camus understood, you know, rebellion itself is uh, a way of asserting one's, uh, one's humanity, one's, you know, if you want to use even theological term, love, uh, it, it, it keeps you alive. Um, it it separates you from the herd. Uh, you know, there's, you know, you, you don't win too much, but sometimes you do win. I mean, I sued Barack Obama and Leon Panetta over the National Defense Authorization Act, and the federal judge issued a temporary injunction, which we're waiting to see if it will become permanent, invalidating a law that allowed the government to use the U.S. military to detain and hold American citizens in military facilities, uh, including our offshore penal colonies. So um, I, I, I think, you know, for me, despair would would be to do nothing, and yet I don't have, I hope, too many illusions about, um, you know, the, the forces that are arrayed against us. But you need to do something to maintain the hope. Well, you don't do anything, there's no hope. Chris Hedges, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Well, that's all for the public this week. Thanks to CIUT station manager Ken Stauer, as well as 
Joseph Novak, Michelle Bonzu, and Sharon Riley. Listen to past episodes at soundcloud.com slash Kevin Caners, or you can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. I'm Kevin Caners. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.